As we reflect on the year that's just gone, it's often been said it's a year like no other in our lifetime. It impacted upon our work, our travel, our family life and our ecclesial life. And here we are in 2021 looking out at a world which is gripped by a degree of fear and apprehension. I guess in Australia we need to remember that we have relatively few inconveniences from COVID compared to other countries. In other countries, there's chaos raging in their hospital systems and in some of the third world countries, who knows exactly what's going on. But it's not just the third world, is it? It's advanced countries like Sweden and Israel and the UK and Europe and the USA are all dealing with COVID outbreaks and the consequences of it. Before we move on to looking ahead, I want to just think about the year that's gone. It was a year that brought some new words into our vocabulary. We now know what social distancing is. And I guess the key word for last year is unprecedented. And we've heard that from almost everybody that had to do with anything about it. But what might we have learned from last year? Well, I've just got three or four things I'd like to put in front of you that are particularly impressed upon me. Number one was, I think it actually refocused our priorities. We had to decide what was really important in life. It's not about the fluff and the overseas holidays, the pleasures that we sometimes indulged in. There are things that really matter. So it, it really helped priorities for myself. I think we all learned how quickly God can turn the world upside down. And to do it with something so minute that you need a microscope to see it. We learned how fragile the economy of the world really is. And if COVID goes on, how many nations might collapse economically? I'll talk a little more about that later on. But on the wide world scene, we've seen so many things happen in this year, which makes it an unprecedented year from the point of Bible prophecy. Perhaps not since 1948 have such significant things happened to advance the expectation we have of the events that will take place around the coming of Christ. I want to just start with this great privilege from Matthew chapter 13. Blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. And the things that we have seen and heard this year, brethren and sisters, many of our pioneer brethren, the, those that have gone before, many righteous men that lived down through the dark ages, would have loved to see these things come to pass. And we have seen them. They've not seen them. They would love to have heard those things which you hear and have not heard them. You think how Brother Thomas would have rejoiced to be able to stand here, not only to see Israel in the land, but to see Russia, the king of the north, hovering over it as we see it and we hear the news. So we have a great privilege, brethren and sisters. Our faith in Bible prophecy has been vindicated. Some of you here will remember that in the 60s and 70s, many new ideas on Bible prophecy arose inside the Brotherhood. Yasser Arafat was the Gog or the man of sin, all of these, these crazy applications to the current events of that time. But you see, the, the understanding that Brother Thomas put in front of us has been vindicated, that the Bible talks about the events of Russia and Israel and the invasion of the Middle East. And haven't things changed very quickly? So I suggest to you that last year was perhaps the greatest outworking of prophecy since 1948. Let's just briefly review some of the things that we have seen. Finally, Brexit is done. Again, some of the more senior amongst us can remember when Britain went in and we had lectures saying Britain will never go into the common market. Well, it did. And it was there for nearly 60 years. But they're out. It's done. And now we can see the realignment that we expected from Ezekiel 38 all along. It's happened. We're already seeing some spiteful ramifications from the EU towards Britain over their exit. So you see, Daniel 11 and Ezekiel 38 are shaping up dramatically in our times. And it's all happening at the same time. Distress of nations with perplexity. The impact of COVID has been dramatic. Think about the deaths in the United States. You know, sometimes they're talking in the hundreds of thousands a month. It's really very worrying. They've now surpassed the number they lost in World War II. Massive state borrowings across the world. 
The economists tell us that there's a fear of what they call a wave of correction that will be necessary to the values of things. They call it the great reset that might trigger another depression. And of course, economists are often wrong, but we don't see the impact yet in this country. Our house values are going up. We've all got all the money the government's been throwing around. But it's not so in most other countries. And who knows the financial impacts of that. Tourism is in chaos. There are anti-restriction riots happening. And there's a great realignment of national alliances. We've also seen here the aggression of the Chinese as they flex their muscles that they have in trade against Australia. We've seen how they've squashed Hong Kong, and we fear for Taiwan and the South China Sea and other nations that they might set their sights on. So the world's in a lot of chaos, distress of nations with perplexity. The anti-curfew riots, can you imagine anything so crazy as absolutely refusing to submit to the public health good, but it's happening. But there are things happening which are very important to us. When you look at Ezekiel 38 and Daniel 11, there are, there are three major parties. There's Russia and its allies, the King of the North. There's Israel dwelling confidently in its own land. And then there's a... What's happened now is we've got Israel's oil and gas boom, boom. Out there in the Mediterranean, just off the coast of Israel, at this time in history, they discovered enormous quantities of oil and gas. And now Israel's found shale oil in the Golan Heights. And it's quite amazing, isn't it, that again, we are providing for us the, the spoil and the prey, which we expected to have at the time of the end. And there is, of course, a great attraction now for Russia to come down into the Middle East. The next thing that Russia has, of course, is its eyes on Egypt. It's quite amazing that, again, in the last year or two, Egypt has discovered gold in the eastern desert and the reserves are estimated at least 1.8 billion and maybe a lot more as they investigate it. Interesting enough, Australian is the man that found it and is developing it. But there's now gold in Egypt. Daniel 11 says that Russia will come for the gold of Egypt. That wasn't possible two years ago. There was no gold in Egypt except a bit in the museums. But now we know why they'll come. The oil, the gas, and the gold. And of course, Israel is a great attraction for its technology. Gold, as you probably know, is the, 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 the one universal and stable currency. What did the Nazis do in the Second World War? The first thing they did as they invaded every country was to raid the gold in the banks and store it up because they could use that to buy oil and war supplies. It was the one stable currency, even in a time of war. So that's lining up according to prophecy. Russia and Turkey are in conflict in Syria, in Armenia, and in Libya setting the scene for the king of the north to come against him, which is Constantinople, like a whirlwind. Well, the Turks have certainly poked the bear. You know, the, the Hagia Sophia was built by the Christians. After 1453, when Constant, Constantinople fell, it was made into a mosque. But then after the First World War, when Turkey was driven back into its perimeters, it was made into a museum by Kemal Ataturk. And it's remained so, being perhaps something everybody can visit, but now it's a mosque again. And that's not pleasing Mr. Putin, because he's a great supporter of the Russian Orthodox Church, who regard that as being theirs. So again, he's poking the bear. Will Russia have that on their sheet of scores to settle? Greece and Turkey are at conflict. Again, the age-old religious conflict that we expect to see. Mr. Putin has passed legislation through his parliament so that he can govern for another 16 years. You might remember that he governed for eight years, had to stand down for a few years, and he came back. But he came back with a bill to get himself, basically, a lifetime premiership. And he can't be challenged until 2032. And you've probably seen from today's news is what he's done to the opposition leader. Tried to kill him with poison. And when the man went to Germany to go to hospital, they've now put him in jail for two and a half years for leaving Russia, because um, he was on parole. <laughs> I mean, where was he supposed to go? Into a Russian hospital? Um, but that just shows you how Mr. Putin really fears this opposition leader. 
but he made his rule very secure. And we don't know if he's the Gog or not, but it'll be somebody like him. So here's a man that is cruel, would fit the pattern of the cruel law that the Bible talks about, a man of arrogance, a man that would oppose the kingdom of Christ. The Russian Navy, you know, after the fall of the Soviet Union and coming into this century, the Russian Navy was in a terrible condition. It was 90% out of date. Old ships, old armaments, old weapons. Today, the Russian Navy is now 62% modernised, perhaps 70% modernised. In other words, everything is the absolute latest in weaponry and in naval ships. And of course, the Bible talks, doesn't it, about many ships being part of the Russian invasion of the Middle East. They've got the latest weapons on these ships. They've now developed nuclear weapons that are so fast that the Israeli defence system they have for shooting down incoming missiles will not stop them. And they're on these ships. You can see the intent that is there. And where are these ships exercising? Well, they're exercising in two places, in the Black Sea, just above Turkey, and between Cyprus and Israel, right on the spot where Israel is going to start drilling for oil. Now, if that's not a warning, I don't know what is. They've just established bases, naval bases, in Syria, in the Sudan, which is the other side of the bottom of the Suez Canal, and in Libya. So they're getting a grip on the Mediterranean with their navy. Many ships, says Ezekiel and Daniel. Well, Russia and Syria. Oh, just by the way, many ships. They've just added, this here is a picture of 40 new ships that have been launched this year. 40 new ships. We've got about three in Australia, I think. They just put 40 into the water. And you get an idea of the many ships. So, of course, in, in Syria, this is a picture of what it was like when the US forces were there. You see the purple part, the Americans were down the south, the Russians came in to help the Syrians, and of course the Turks were having a go at the north. But President Trump said he didn't want to be there, so he pulled out. Iran's come on the scene. Now, look carefully at this picture. This is a poster that is displayed in, in Tehran, in, in Persia, or Iran, promising the PLO that they're going to get their land back. Palestine will be free. The final solution. That ought to send tingles down our spines. That was what the Nazis decided to call the Holocaust, the final solution. So there's the intent of Iran, to eradicate Israel. And they are joining with, of course, Iran is right very near to this, but they are joining now with Syria and with the Russians. And the Russians have moved in. And this is the picture today, now that the US has gone home. Look at those little planes there, you can see. There are now five Russian air bases in Syria within 100 kilometres of a number of Jewish cities. That's here to Murray Bridge. Doesn't take long for a jet plane to go that distance. Five Russian air bases on the border of Israel. That's beside the Navy out at sea. Gives you some idea, doesn't it, of, of the threat that the Russians now pose having been entrenched in Syria. Oops, all right. We saw something this year which was deemed impossible. I guess if you're like me, you grew up wondering when we had Ezekiel 38 lectures where we talked a lot about Tarshish and the young lions thereof. We sort of just glossed over Sheba and Dedan, not knowing how that would be that Arab nations would suddenly be on Israel's side and protesting against the invader. And then this happened this year, perhaps the most incredible event of the year, that the UAE and Bahrain and other nations of the Arabs are now signing up accords with Israel. Already, financial support to the PLO and Hamas has been halved. That's going to create tensions in the Middle East. So these countries are no longer pouring money in to support the PLO and Hamas and Hezbollah and places like that. You know, it's Iran supporting Hezbollah, but, this, but the PLO are not getting the money they used to from these nations. Now, President Trump was a, an interesting figure, perhaps a great example of God raising up the basest of men to do his will. 
not a very nice character, proud and arrogant. But he achieved some remarkable things in relation to Bible prophecy. He recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital. He moved the US Embassy to Jerusalem, and other nations have now followed suit. He closed the Peel office in Washington. President Biden just reopened it. But Trump shut it because they, they wouldn't come to the peace talks. So he said, well, I'm closing your embassy. Well, Biden has opened it up again. He recognized the Golan Heights as Israel's territory. So the shale oil they found on the Golan Heights, they can now mine. He hit back at the UNO bias towards the Palestinians, and he actually challenged the UNO, who, of course, have passed some 240-odd motions condemning Israel and not one condemning the Palestinians. That just shows the bias in the UNO, but he's challenged that openly. He came up with a peace plan for the Middle East, the Abraham Accords. He gave the okay for Israel to put settlers in the West Bank, and he scuttled the pretty worthless Iran nuclear deal. So Trump achieved a lot around Israel. We're not getting involved in American politics, but when it came to the Middle East, he was the man for the time to put Israel in the position they're in. When we look outside political events, and I deliberately didn't put any pictures in because you don't need to see the images that I've seen, sure you've seen elsewhere. You know that we live in the days of Lot. It always sickens me when I see the, the, the news reports of the Mardi Gras in Sydney and other places where one million spectators come out to watch. I think it's absolutely a condemnation of this country that that should happen. Not only are we haughty and committing abomination in these things, but look at the arrogance of these people. The show of their countenance does witness against them. And they're right out there in the streets and they're in our faces trying to get us to accept these things. Days of Noah, you know what they were. Evil imaginations. Hasn't our world provided for evil imaginations? You can get every single perversion you want with a tap of a keyboard or a phone. In the days of Noah, mind, the minds were corrupted, led to violence. They became scoffers and mockers, as we read in 2 Peter chapter 3. And we're certainly pretty close to that in our world today. And we need to ask the question. I want you to just notice in the 2 Peter chapter 2 a couple of things about Noah and Lot that are mentioned here. You know, we look for a world in which dwelleth righteousness. When you read about Noah and Lot in the second of Peter chapter 2, it says of Noah in verse 5, he was a preacher of righteousness. And when you read verse 7 and 8, three times in two verses, Lot is called that righteous Lot. Vexed every day with the deeds of the wicked. And we have to ask ourselves, do we hunger and thirst for the day when righteousness will flood the earth and evil will be removed? Because the day is coming, brethren and sisters. He's appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. And the world will learn righteousness, says Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 9. So there will be a judgment in righteousness. Then there will be an education in righteousness. And you probably know from the prophets that the name that God gives to the city of Jerusalem is Yahweh our righteousness. And the name of the king in Jerusalem will be Yahweh our righteousness. You can check it out in the prophets. Because that's going to be the hallmark of the kingdom. The ways of God, the morality of God, the thinking of God will be impressed upon people's minds by the education of the kingdom. But what do we see today? Well, we see protests. The sea and the waves roaring, said Jesus, will be a sign of his coming kingdom. And you might say, well, protest against injustice is okay. Where did it end up? Looting, chaos, deaths. You see, that's what happens, isn't it? When you unleash the genie out of the bottle, you let human nature take its protest to the streets. But it's not just the left. We saw the right-wing reactionaries take over the Congress building in America. And we now have a totally divided nation of extremes, rednecks on one side and liberals on the other. And those rednecks scare me. They worry me with their guns and their threats and their refusal to submit to things. But I'm just as worried by the left. 
When Congress opened for the year, a congressman who was actually a reverend stood up to give the opening prayer for Congress. When he closed the prayer, he said this, our men and our women. You think that's funny? Look it up on YouTube. You can see it. Our men and our women. In other words, we can't talk about men without talking about women in equal terms. That actually happened in the US Congress by an elected representative. Because Nancy Pelosi, the leader of the Congress, had just put a bill into the House to get rid of gender specific language in all US institutions. If it goes through, and it may not because some of the Democrats don't even like it, this is the first bill she put up, gender neutral language. You cannot say father, mother, son, daughter, aunt or uncle anymore. It's parent sibling or parents relations. You can't talk about aunts. That's what she wants to put through. This is the madness from the left. And you're going to see a lot of things coming from the left in America because they've been waiting a long time to get rid of Trump and to put in some of their policies. But that just shows you. You know, what I found amazing was that Donald Trump is a better theologian than that reverend. Because our men is Latin for so be it. That's why it's on the end of prayers. But he comes along and says, our men and our women. How crazy can you get? And Donald Trump's tweet was actually quite good. But it just shows you the madness that's involved in the world. And, you know, the Bible said that before Armageddon, there would be the spirit of demons, the spirit of the French Revolution. Liberty, equality and fraternity would bring insanity to the world. And we're starting to see that in the highest halls of power, even in America. You know, it says in the Bible that one of the signs of the last days would be they would despise it of those that are good. And you might not have heard of the cancel, the cancel culture. This little article here I'll leave on this table. We want to grab that. Congress in the grip of the cancel culture. In other words, if you don't agree with their modernistic policies, then they will rub you out. They will have you so much under pressure that you'll just give up and go away. They will not let you have your free speech anymore. People have gone down this spiral of cancel culture and the idea that everything is offensive. Everything you say offends me, therefore you have to be quietened. They can say what they like. You know, here is you know, people being rubbed out because they don't agree. Every time hate speech is permitted. Now bear in mind, to the modern world, hate speech would be saying that Israel is God's chosen nation. That's hatred against the Palestinians. Hate speech would be saying that you cannot criticise homosexuals. That's hate speech today. It's legislated in Britain as hate speech. It costs someone part of their self. So what they're saying is that you have to, to, to eliminate people who don't agree with your liberal principles. Now you might, no, you might not remember Margaret Court, some of the older ones would. Margaret Court was Australia's greatest ever tennis player. She won 16 Grand Slams through the 1960s. It's taken 55 years since her retirement for her to be recognised in Australia with an AO medal. 55 years. Other people retire and they get one the next week. You know, Tim Cale, the soccer got his after three months retirement. It took 55 years for her to be recognised. The greatest tennis player we've ever had in this country. Why? Because she is a, is, a, is a pastor in a church and she goes publicly on the Bible's basis of her views on sexuality. So she is now being vilified and hated and they want to take her name off the courts in Melbourne where they were put after she retired. What's more, Daniel Andrews, on Australia Day when the awards were announced, publicly slammed her as a person who preaches hate and said she should not have been given an award. She's hated because of her Bible-based views and she's a very moderate person about Bible-based views. She's not an extremist. She just says, I see it this way. But because she's gone public with those views, they're trying to rub her out. This is the cancel culture we're up against. We need to be aware of it because it's going to come our way. There are already brethren in the UK who will not allow their lectures and their Bible classes to be published on the rugby website because they could lose their jobs. Because it's deemed hate speech 
it's deemed racism to talk about Israel being the one chosen people. So be aware, this is another thing that's happened this year, is this cancel culture. Kerry O'Brien, just retired from the ABC, was given an award on Australia Day. He refused to accept it because it was the same day as Margaret Court. He would not be awarded a medal for his services on the ABC because she was getting one the same day. That's the cancel culture. We've got to be aware of that. It's coming our way. The question is, will we continue to witness faithfully to what the Bible says? Fear of losing employment because of racism and hate speech accusations. Even questioning other religions is now unacceptable. Are we ready to be persecuted for righteousness sake and to be evil spoken of as the Lord said in the Sermon on the Mount? You will be persecuted for righteousness sake. And they are questions we're going to have to face because this, this left-wing enforcement of their views is coming. I was talking to a brother the other day who's quite high up in his company and he said he can no longer apply for promotions because they said to him, there was a time when you could say, well, this is the company view and that's my view. But he said, unless I'm now prepared to be what they call a disruptor, I can't be promoted. I have to challenge people in my department, not only about the work they do, but about their values in life. I have to disrupt the way they think. And if I can't do that, that I'm no good to them. He said, I can't apply for promotions anymore because I'm not a disruptor. See, that's how it's influenced right through society. Okay, well, there are world events that challenge, you know, the world out there. Things are happening out there. And I guess they encourage us and inspire us because we see the Bible prophecy coming to pass. But we really can't control any of those things. What we've got to worry about is how we're going to get through whatever time is left until the Lord comes, and it might not be immediate. You know, the Bible says in Daniel 12, there shall be a time of trouble such as never was, and at the same time, thy people shall be delivered. There's been some pretty horrendous times in the past. I don't think we're actually there yet. Doesn't mean Christ couldn't come any time. We should be ready for that any time. But it might get worse, brethren and sisters. It might be the last challenge we have to face. And the challenges we're going to face are challenges that are within brotherhood. We can do something about these. I've just made a list here. I'm going to talk about some of these over the next uh, few minutes. But these are the things that I think that really are challenging our brotherhood right at the moment. And, and can I just say this? There's a, there's a tremendous lot of back and forwards between us and the UK at the moment because they are in deep trouble in these areas deep trouble. A loss of sense of uniqueness of our hope. You know, we have a hope that is based upon the promises made to the fathers, the hope of Israel, the hope of the kingdom of God on the earth. We have correct views about the, you know, the Trinity and the devil and all those things that really matter to what you believe. The atonement is unique to Christadelphians. But there's a failure to see that there's one saving truth that the Bible has outlined will get us into God's kingdom. And once people let go of that, once they say, well, look, all these BASF and Cooper Carter and Denims are just man-made documents, once they go down that path, then you can say, well, probably all the Christians will be saved. And there are many Christadelphians today who believe that. In fact, somebody sat in my lounge room the other day and sold that to me. They thought all the Christians will be saved. That leads to open fellowship with other Christians. And that's happening in Australia. It's certainly happening in England. Ecclesiastes decide to bring in marketing experts. I can show you this on a video if you like. The brother was boasting. They'd brought in marketing experts to actually find out why people are not coming to the lectures and how to remedy that. So they brought these people in. And, of course, the marketing experts say, well, you've got to give people what they want. Now, I thought preaching was about telling people what God wanted them to hear. But no, you've got to give them what they want to hear. So you dumb it down. Don't talk about doctrine. You don't talk about repentance or sin or anything like that. You talk about nice things they want to And why don't you focus on them, what they need in life? So that's a problem we have. Involved with a protest and social issues. The talk was given in the city two months ago. Not only were a brother and a sister spoke to a Bible class, but 
where the advocate of that talk was to go out and get involved in, in Black Lives Matter protests. And the Bible was used to put a case for that. If you want the, the thing, I can show you where to find it. That happened in this city. People advocating get involved in protests and social issues. Christadelphians have started voting in the last few years to try and sort out the world problems. We're in speakers, you're aware of that one's come around, it's still around in many places. Spirit guidance, where what I feel is what matters, not what the Bible tells me to believe. Theistic evolution, we've talked about a lot. Full inspiration of the Bible is question. We're now getting plenty of people saying, well, maybe the Bible is not fully inspired. If you ever hear this little phrase at the beginning of a talk, and you'll hear it on this talk about getting involved in protest, this was the opening phrase. The Bible was not written to us, but it's there for us. That's an incredibly subtle phrase. What that's saying, if you unwind it, is the Bible was written to people who lived in Israel three and a half thousand years ago and to those who lived in the first century, and all their cultural context determined what was written. We can actually only pick up the parts of the Bible that we think apply to us. That's what that statement means. So that's very clever, and that comes straight from the what's called now the, the new evangelicals. And of course, postmodern values. I'm gonna say something about postmodernism. I know people think perhaps I bang on about this too much, but I believe this is the, the one thing that is actually our greatest danger and already the signs of postmodern thinking are very wide in our brotherhood. Now, humanism came in in the 90s. Humanism was called modernism and they got rid of God, no God, no judgment, no afterlife, no absolute right and wrong anymore. Everything is relative to the situation. And the morals of society where you can do whatever you like, just don't harm anyone else's rights. And of course, it's all about you. You are the center of the universe. It's about the good life. That was the humanism, but it failed. They didn't solve the world's problems. Science didn't come up with the answers and society got worse. So they modified it into postmodernism. Having got rid of God, this is what postmodernism is about, and this is their own words. Postmodernity, in contrast to modernism, rejects any notion of objective truth. So the fundamental principle of postmodernism is there are no absolutes of any kind. The only absolute in the universe is that there are no absolutes. Tolerance is the supreme virtue, so every view has got to be accepted, and not only accepted, it has to be promoted as being good and exclusivity, the supreme vice. So people who say, well, that's right, that's, that's right and that's wrong, or this is not acceptable, that's exclusivity. Truth is not grounded in reality or any authoritative text like the Bible, simply constructed in the mind of the individual. So it's all about what goes on in your head. How you feel about it is what matters. That's their own words. Just to define very quickly what it means, and this is from, again, from their book, no truth, many truths, no principles, only preferences, no, good, no grand reason, no reason for us to be here. We just happen to be here. No grand narrative of human progress. The true believer is the real danger. You see, that's the, the cancel culture. The one that they fear most is the person who's got a definite view on something. The great danger is not error, but intolerance and so on. And you can, you can just see where that's heading. Another element of postmodernism which was different to humanism was what they call deconstructionism. And that is, history was written to, to just control us. So when you read in the history books, all the events that are recorded for us and the interpretation is wrong. It was just written by those who wanted to keep us under control. So you have to rewrite history. You have to reread history and come up with a different interpretation. And it happens in the Bible. People reinterpret the Bible. You know, we've made a stand against not getting involved in social politics for the whole of our community's life. And yet a brother can get up in this city and tell people to go out, pick up their banners and protest alongside the Black Lives Matter. How would that go down if we go to court for conscientious objection? That we don't get involved in the politics of society. But this is what's happening. People are reinterpreting the Bible. And they want to fit in with the world. This is what they say. History is represented to show that the world was mad in the past, that religious authority and aristocratic power led us to wars, horrors, genocide, persecution, slavery, xenophobia, racism, and suppression of women. So history is being rewritten. The major textbook used in United States schools has 10 mentions of a woman's conference 
for emancipation that was held in 1849. Ten times it comes up in the history book for the United States. No one's ever heard of it before, that book was published. But the Wright brothers didn't get in to the book of the history of America. It just shows you how they, they imbalance the history books to actually point out that the whole important thing in America was this women's conference in 1849. Ten times it's raised in the book. It just shows you how they control it and they're rewriting history. How do they do it? Well, all texts can be interpreted as you want. You don't say, what is the writer trying to tell me? What you say is, what do I feel about that? If I don't like it, I can reject it. I'm the centre of the universe. If I don't like it, I can say, no, I'm not going to go along with that. History is rewritten. History is judged by modern norms. So look at the stolen generations. You know, we come and say, what they, just, we have to say sorry and all these things. But they don't talk about what might have happened to those children, many of them who would have died. There's the push for equality for women. Of course, that affected the brotherhood in, in a few years ago. And they judge God and they say, well, look, this God of the Bible, he committed genocide of the Canaanites. He, he gave slavery approval. He oppressed women. He kept women down. So history is being reinterpreted. Instead of saying, what did God do for women in the Bible, which is a remarkably wonderful thing God did for women in Israel, God ends up being a misogynist. I love this little statement. For those of you who are, will probably see the irony in it. Postmodernists say all truth is relative. But of course, that statement's meant to be true. <laughs> if everything's relative, then the statement is relative. It just shows you the stupidity of all this thinking. How does it get into our thinking? How does it get there? Well, the print and TV media is very strong, it's humanist based. Um, you know, you read most of the papers. Perhaps not the Australian so much, but most of the newspapers and certainly the ABC, very left-leaning and very humanist-based. Social networking platforms are biased to postmodernism thinking and feeding our lusts. You go down the path of looking at a subject on YouTube and you will get worse and worse and, and less suitable things put in front of you to take you down that path. It's geared that way. Those of you who have done that know exactly what I'm talking about. You know, Google and Facebook are, are committed to the postmodern agenda. Most modern movies have the themes of sexuality, of the way the postmodernists see it, news feeds and novels likewise. The education curriculum, we can't go into that tonight, but again, that has been under attack. The academic attitude. We had some girls a couple of years ago started their nursing studies at the university. The first session, they were asked to put up their hands if anyone in the audience believed in God and they were mocked by the professor. You see, that's the way the world's going. ex christadelphians poisoning young minds, and you don't need me to go into all the detail about that, but it's happening in a big way. And even more scary, the wave of new evangelicals. If somebody mentioned to you a fellow called John Walton, check him out for yourself. You know, the evangelical church has been greatly harassed and taken over by these new evangelicals who are reinterpreting the Bible, reinterpreting archaeology and reinterpreting history and coming up with totally different conclusions to the evangelical church. It's leading to a great dissatisfaction in their church. John Walton was quoted extensively in a talk in this city and nobody else knew who he was. It was the basis of the brothers' talk on archaeology quoting John Walton, coming up with the same conclusions that the Bible can't be trusted. So this is, this is the sort of thing that's happening out there in the world. It invades religion. You're talking about marketing strategies. You know, you find out what people want. You've got to come to the door, you've got to give them what they want. So you dumb down the doctrine, get rid of exclusive names, set aside topics like sin, morals and repentance, and how can we meet your needs? You know, we have coffee lounges, we have psychology classes and child minding and we do this. Everything you want, you come and, and just pick whatever suits you. So support groups, entertainment, life, drama, spectacles, modern music. And people are not given what they actually need, which is the truth of the gospel. It's what God wants them to hear. They don't get that. But you get them in the door. But as the Pentecostals have found, the door is a revolving one. Now, have we seen these signs in our midst? Well, 
I think we're seeing some of these already. People avoiding challenging lecture titles. You know, I used to give lectures years ago, like, you know, the, the deception of modern Pentecostalism. 63 Pentecostals turned up and the meeting ended in chaos. But we used to give those sort of lectures. Jehovah's Witnesses astray from the Bible. We don't quite get so many titles like that anymore. We avoid criticising the Catholic apostasy and their doctrines. We avoid condemning bad morals. This, in places in the Brotherhood, these things are happening. Lack of action when something goes morally wrong. Liberal translations, some of them very readable, like the Message Bible. But it's not accurate. It's not what God actually said. And I know translations are difficult, but keep away from the ones that are really loose and written by Trinitarians. We try to appear, to, appear, to appear socially connected, so we do charity runs and go out and do things like that, just to, so that the community will see us as that we're actually community-minded. Fun runs, clean-up days, etc. Focus on testimonies. Instead of exposition, we're getting people getting up and giving testimonies about their life experience. Moving from educating to entertaining people. Respecting all opinions as being equally valid, whether they're true or not. And the ecumenical spirit. Focusing on similarities and not the differences that exist between us and the other churches. Now, I want to just show you how the other churches have capitulated to postmodernism. This is Billy Graham. You might remember Billy Graham came to Australia, went around the world preaching the one true gospel of salvation as he saw it. He would not fellowship the Catholic Church in his early life. Today, Billy Graham, before he, before he died, but the people come from Muslim world or the Buddhist world or the non-believing world, they're members of the body of Christ because they've been called by God. They may not know the name of Jesus, but they know in their hearts that they need something that they do not have. They turn to the only light they have, and I think they are saved and going to be with us in heaven. That's incredible. That is a complete reversal of his position when he first became the world's leading preacher. And now he's saying they're going to be in heaven with him. Well, I'm sorry about that. None of them are going there anyway. But you can just see this inclusivity. What about the good old Catholic Church? Pope Francis. They got rid of Ratzinger because he was a hardliner. Pope Francis comes along. No distinctions matter to God. How nice that brothers are united, that brothers may together pray together. How nice to see that nobody negotiates the history on the path of faith that we are diverse. We want to be, and already begin to be, a reconciled diversity. This is the church that burnt, drowned our brethren and sisters and so many other people that wouldn't agree with them. Estimated that the total people who suffered death at the hands of the Inquisition and the Catholic persecutions estimated be over 60 million. And they come along saying we were reconciled diversity. Nobody talking about the history. We just got to get on with each other. And this is Pope Francis. Religion becomes a cafeteria-style approach. You lay all the goodies and people take what they want. You only talk on social needs and positive subjects. You don't talk about sin, death and judgment or righteousness to come. Feel-good culture. You have a right to be happy. God loves you any way you are. And you become the centre of the universe. They, these are the postmodern thinking that can invade even our brotherhood. And so men end up being lovers of their own selves. Modernism brought the me generation Postmodernism bought the me, me, me generation and the age of selfies. Pope Francis again, this is one of his friends who spoke to the media. He said he won't change doctrine. What he will do is to return the church to its true doctrine, the one that it has forgotten, the one that puts man back at the centre. For too long, the church has put sin at the centre. So we're going to get rid of sin as problem. We put man in the centre and we, we'd say this is all about man. Well, I thought it was all about God, actually. By putting the suffering of man and his relationship to God back in the centre, those harsh attitudes towards homosexuality, divorce and other things will start to change. And the other day, Pope Francis has allowed women to take part in the ceremonies of the Catholic Eucharist. Why is he doing that after all these centuries of resistance? because of the pressure of postmodernism, the spirit of insanity working miracles. Out of the mouth of the false prophet, you're getting the spirit of the French Revolution. And that's happening. So what about us Christadelphians? How do we stand? 
We hide the name, the biblically based name, Christadelphian, the brethren in Christ, the Adelphos on Christos. You find it in Colossians 1 verse 2. It's where Brother Thomas got it from. It's a Bible name for the Ecclesia. We hide it from the public. The other day, I got a thing bobbed up on my Facebook on Sunday morning, and it said, so glad to be at XXX Church. From people who were in my wedding. So glad to be at church again. They've dropped the use of the word ecclesia. The name Christadelphian's been going missing in many a places. You bring in the modern music, drama, psychology, in lieu of sound exposition. Focus on needs, unity, love, forgiveness at the expense of God's righteousness and God's laws being honoured. And anyone who stands up and says, I don't like this, or I think this is not what the Bible talks about, or you're nitpicking. And that's the phrase which has been circulating quite a bit just recently, you're nitpicking if you make any objection to things. So let's be aware that this is the postmodern influence upon us. I'm going to just tick along to a quote from Brother Harry Tennant. You know, Brother Harry Tennant wrote this just before he died. I wonder what Brother Harry would think if he came back to the Ecclesia world today. We are not one church among many. We are separate from them. We do have no part or lot with them. There are next to no similarities over things that matter. How God judges them is not our concern. They do not believe the same God as us, the same Jesus Christ, the nature of man, salvation, baptism, atonement, or the same kingdom of God. They do not share the same beliefs regarding warfare, politics, voting, or belief in the devil. In fact, they don't believe the same Bible. Because to them, the Bible is no longer fully inspired. How quickly things change. Look at this. This is in relation to theistic evolution. This is, again, Pope Francis addressing the Academy of Science. He said this, the big band and evolution theories are real and essential to the understanding of God. The theory of evolution is not incompatible with the existence of a creator. When we read about the creation in Genesis, we run the risk of imagining God was a magician with a magic wand able to do everything, but that is not so. This is the Pope preaching theistic evolution. Jehovah Witnesses, once firm creationists, are now preaching theistic evolution. Right from the top. You can read it in their magazines. Of course, what they do is they say, you know, some people used to think, like you think, who are these dumb people who used to think that? Well, it was actually them. <laughs> but they always put it out that somebody else is making this silly mistake. Um, but now they preach theistic evolution. Well, the Bible says God is a miracle worker. God commands and it is done. He made the heavens with the word of his mouth. God can do that. He has a magic wand, so to speak. But you see, the Pope says he hasn't. He can't do those things. He's got to rely upon an evolutionary process. I'm going to just skip over the evolutionary creation. You know, the, the, the real issue, brethren and sisters, with, it, with this evolution is the attack upon the inspiration of the scriptures. You can argue all day about the scientific evidence. You can argue all day about how people want to reinterpret the Bible. The problem we have is the attack upon the Bible's inspiration. You quote to them, in six days God made the heavens and the earth, and they will say that's a scribal insertion. and give you a whole list of theologians that agree with that. Anything they don't like, they alter, they change, they disregard. That's why it's so dangerous. not about the science so much. It's about the attack upon the inspiration of the Bible. That's why they call themselves God-directed evolutionists. They have the Darwin model without chance. God kicks in the DNA as you go along. Let me just quote to you two examples of this. And I wouldn't quote this if I hadn't corresponded with a brother extensively over it. This is Jonathan Pogson. May we each open our eyes to the unfolding glory, truth, and wisdom of beauty of God's creation as is revealed through science. The great light, Jesus, came into the world to reveal the truth did not illuminate science, but he addressed the needs of the human heart. So Jesus ignored the science. He just talked about what the human heart needed. This is where it leads you, though. May we each open our eyes. Sorry. Next one. We're all familiar with Eden's imagery and devices. A talking snake who beguiles an innocent woman who didn't have a mother. A V fall from a sleeping man's rib. Supernatural trees, etc. As an allegory, Eden's story is deep. As a literal historical record, it's weak. It employs highly symbolic and fantastic imagery to convey its message. 
You see, that's where it leads you. You can reinterpret the Bible as you see fit. That's the danger of theistic evolution. I'm not going to say any more about that because you've probably heard plenty about that along the way. I want to just get on to something. Um, I want to move into this. I want to move to this one, brethren and sisters, because I already believe that what we need to do in these last days is just think about the Lord Jesus Christ once he became immortal. You know, Christ on the earth gave us tremendous examples of how to live, tremendous examples of what God is like. He gave us great principles. The Gospels teach us about individual discipleship and character. The epistles teach us about the structure of ecclesial life and the doctrines we believe. But the apocalypse, brethren and sisters, prepares us to share with Jesus Christ the rulership of the world. If we're going to share that with him, brethren and sisters, as kings and priests, then we need to understand that this is the mind of the Jesus Christ, immortal, in heaven, 60-odd years after he was crucified. He's had all this time to think about all the information of future history that God has given him. He now understands fully how God's going to make his plan work, what the ecclesiastes are going to suffer in the years to come through God's foreknowledge. And that letter is written to his servants. It's only written to his servants. It's in code, written to his servants, that they might understand what he now knows and to give them the right attitudes. It's written to the ecclesiastes. Write it to the seven ecclesiastes. In other words, to all ecclesiastes in every age written for servants, from a bridegroom. He's now got a long absence where he can't speak to us for 2,000 years. What's he going to say in this last letter besides the history? And wouldn't the bride read that letter with great intensity to say, this is the mind of my risen immortal Lord? Because it's what he needs us to understand. It needs us to adopt these values. And look at some of these values. This is the immortal Jesus we relate to. I'm not going to go through all of those. They are the titles that you find in Revelation where he describes himself in this way. Him that loved us and saved us from our sins. The one that is, was dead and is alive. The first begotten from the dead. He walks in the midst of the ecclesias. The lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David. The lamb that had been slain. The heavenly bridegroom. The lamb upon Mount Zion. And so it goes on. This is how Jesus said, this is, you've got to see me like this now. Our relationship. Are we interested? He wants us to be kings and priests. We're in the kingdom, says John, because of the beliefs that we have. We're sealed, being sealed in the foreheads, with the impressed with the mind of God. And if we are sealed, we'll be in the perfected Israel, the 144,000. Kings and priests reigning with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the relationship he wants to form with us. And he says this, hear what I've got to say. Hear what the Spirit has to say to the Ecclesias. I've written this, he says in chapter 22, to show to the Ecclesias the things which must shortly come to pass. Behold, I come suddenly. And he's appealing to us. Last three times in that last chapter, he says, behold, I come suddenly. He wants us to be ready for his coming. But do we share the feelings of Jesus? Can we in this postmodern world say that we stand alongside Jesus? Well, he would be condemned for hate speech. You see, Jesus says there are things that I hate. That's not how most people view the Lord Jesus Christ. They say he's all tolerant. But he says, I hate things. I hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, and I hate the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. I hate them, says Jesus. And if we don't share that, brethren and sisters, we're not with him. We've got to hate those wrong doctrines because they're leading people to their death. He said, you've got to do something about it. Where they tolerated these things, he said, I've got things against you. Where they got rid of those things, he says, you've tried them and you've got rid of those things. I commend you for that, he said. But I've got these things against these ecclesias. And they've got to do something about it or he will come and take away their lampstand. Now, these are very serious attitudes the Lord is giving to the ecclesia world. Think about the values of Jesus we should share. You know, the unique concept that we are the chosen and the prepared bride, the redeemed of the Israel of God, the remnant of the woman's seed. So many unique terms used in Revelation about those who come into the truth. And all of us feel totally unworthy of the grace of God. 
None of us deserve it. Nothing we can do gives us a right to that. But God's called us. He's given us the one saving truth. He's given us the opportunity to be part of that. You know, we have a fantastic privilege, but we don't deserve any of it. And there are better people in the churches who live much better lives and and community-based lives than we do. But God says, you are the ones I have chosen to be the bride for my son. Come to Revelation 19. You know, in Revelation 19, we quote joyfully verses 7 and 8 so often about the bride of Christ. It says there, let us be glad and rejoice and give honour to him for the bride of, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. She's arrayed in white and fine linen, which is the righteousness of saints. That imputed righteousness given to us. But you ever notice what the chapter opens with? Because forget the chapter division. Chapter 18 is about the destruction of the great mother of harlot system. The prophets and the apostles rejoice over here because their blood was found in that system. And in verse 1 and 2, the saints joyfully join in the rejoicing with the apostles and prophets over the total annihilation of every trace of that harlot system. Verse 1, after these things I heard a great voice of much people now in rulership in heaven, saying with a loud voice, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honour and power be to the Lord of our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. He's judged the great whore, which corrupted the earth with her fornication and avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. I want you to think about some of our brethren who gave their lives for the truth. Like Albert Mertz, who was shot in the German prison. Like our brethren who suffered in Poland and in Europe under the heel of the Catholic Church, who were tortured and hanged. What are they going to say to Christadelphians who are happy to openly fellowship with the churches. And that's happening in this country. What are they going to say to them? What are the Christadelphians going to say to those brethren who saw that doctrine was so important they would give their lives for it? Can we sing that song with confidence? Really feeling part of it? That's the question, isn't it? We all want to be in the bride, we all want to be the bride, but that's what the bride sings. And you see, that's what we need to do. Get, it, get the values of Jesus Christ, the immortal Jesus Christ, into our minds. Oops. Okay, well, I'm just going to cut to the end now. So just, you know, witnesses. You know, the, the new revelation is full of the, of, the, of the subject of witnessing. And, of course, the testimony of Jesus is the continuation of the witness of the prophets. God loves his faithful witnesses. And they're going to be greatly rewarded. You read the Revelation. So often it says things like, you know, I'm, I'm of thy brethren the prophets and those that have the word of God, that keep the sayings of this book, but the prophets are always there. And we need to pick up from Revelation not just the history, we need to pick up the attitudes that come through from the Lord Jesus Christ about what's going to happen in this world in the very near future. And I want you to come to Revelation 22, the final words. And think about this, brethren and sisters. The very last thing that Jesus can say to us for 2,000 years. What would you say if you were in his position? This is what he says. Revelation 22. I testify to every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plague that are written in this book. Now who does the adding? You think about it. Who does the adding? Well, the Catholics speak ex cathedra. They put in laws that they claim come from God. The Mormons have the Book of Mormon added to the Bible. Pentecostals have revelations of prophecy and spirit revelations that they add to the Bible. Jehovah Witnesses have their apostles that add to the Bible. The SDAs have Ellen White. They add to the Bible. God says, I've got plagues reserved for those people because they have deceived people by adding to my Bible. And then he says, there's another group that are in even greater danger. And these are people whose names are in the book of life. Look what it says there about taking away. If any man shall take away from the words of the prophecy, God 
shall take away his part out of the book of life. The danger is that Christadelphians, those in the faith, will start to say that God doesn't mean what he said, that you don't take so much notice of the Bible. The Bible is not wholly inspired. That you can superimpose that Genesis is a bunch of myths written for ignorant Jews. And you can say that these verses are scribal insertions and you take away from the book that God has written. That's the last thing Jesus said to the whole ecclesial world. Do not let people steal the words of the God from you. And the people who do that are people who start out in the book of life. You know, he didn't talk about plagues for them. He said these, they lose their part in the book of life. The people who were once there. That's the great danger of those who preach other things. So, brethren and sisters, I'm going to leave it there and just say to you, it's a time to lift up our heads. You know, there's a terrible world out there. It may get worse. But we understand Bible prophecy. We know where we're going. We can look at all these events that the world is so concerned about and say we expect it to get worse before it gets better. We have to encourage our young people to continue to hold the things dear that we have so long fought for in this city. We want to keep up our attitude to Bible understanding. We want to keep up the attitude to Bible prophecy. The sincerity of the way we treat each other and live with each other is important. Brethren and sisters, the night is far spent. The day is at hand. Even so come, Lord Jesus.